So this is this is the rigging one, right? Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. ah. <laughs> Putting a boat together. How to set up a boat. So you had a question. What's your name? Ryan. Ryan? Ryan had a question that was if you get a boat, you buy a boat from somebody and it's beat up and pins are all over the place because it was from Cincinnati Juniors and he took a wrench and just hit the pin in. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I do that too. I'm like, I don't have a tool. I would get it. Um, just getting the person to where they need to be is important. So, you know, what do you do with a boat that you have that everything is, you have no idea what the numbers are, right? Where do you start? Well, generally, I would have, in my early years, I would have gone to a rigging chart that, like Chris showed, that says, these people should be rigged at, boys should be rigged at 84, girls should be rigged at 85, and I would have started there, right? Now, after all these years of, beating my head against the wall, seeing that those don't result in what should be happening, I changed, right? Eric did the same thing. He is completely opposite of what everything you've ever been told. <laughs> and it works, right? I mean, staking people that shouldn't be competitive and making them competitive. And it's a lot of it is giving the right opportunity to these kids to perform. So taking these boats, now what I do for our girls we're at 82, right? I just start every boat we get for the girls. We take, you know, comes in pieces. Like all the boats I get, get delivered incomplete, so we can protect them from the salt water we were talking about. If we brought them, so you know, we put them all together when we get them. And at 82, the guys, most of our guys now, will end up being 83, right? And then our varsity eight will end up being 84. Right? Sounds kind of backwards, right? This is exactly what you were, no way, that's absolutely back. But what we were saying in that, that panel was, it's all about getting the right stroke rate. Like those numbers are from Olympians. Somebody went, Chris, or, or uh, what's his name, went and measured all the boats and said, this Olympian that got a gold medal was spread at, or the span was, 160. Well, okay, he's 6'5", he's a genetic phenom. What does that have to do with your kids? Nothing. Nothing at all. But, obviously, that moves the boat. Like, Chris will say, we fought last night watching video, and it was about, he said, what can you say about that technique? And I said, she's shooting her slide, she's doing this, doing that. Medal at the Olympics. Can't argue, right? So. This is where we are with rigging. Rig, those rigging charts are standard, like a great place to start. They are. So if you get a boat, you know, and you have standard people, or you have, say your athletes are 6'2", right? That's standard in high school rowing, right? I'm just kidding. So 6'2", I would say, all right, well, I'm going to rig it 84. Boys or girls, doesn't matter. I go through, put the pins on, get them to 80 my 84 and then then start rigging pitch right make sure the pins are vertical make sure the backstays are on straight you know put, the, put all that together and then height wise you know it, that's, it comes with experience right most if you're 6'2 we'll just say you're going to be 17 and a half right above the seat again this number that you got I said 17 and a half when I was saying it doesn't matter where you get the number as long as you use the number and it's your standard, right? When he, Eric was talking about his ratio, right? That low ratio number. Like, I have used gearing and stupidly because that's what I've done since the 90s. I, I don't know if it's right or wrong, but guess what? My number in sculling for the 2.73 is what I was looking for, right? For some boat. And I've stuck with that, that method, coming up with that number has always been my standard. I don't care what the blade size is. I mean, Eric is, goes way scientific and says the surface area, right? So that he could go from ore to ore and say, I need to make these adjustments. I'd scratch a race if I had to row fat twos, so I don't care. Um, I just, smoothie twos, always standard, <coughs> whatever. But you're saying, like, so 17 and a half is a good starting point, and then the footboards, the heels, 
I just mimic. I do equal height, warlock height, and then foot stretch. And I measure from the lowest point on the seat, right? I don't. Some people me measure from the highest point on the seat. Some people. So you have to ask. We were at Worlds this year, putting the eight together for the boys, and we asked Brian, "Where did you get your height from?" He's like, "I don't know. I don't care. Can you put him somewhere like 18? Him at 20, and this person at 18. Their heels. I mean, the guys were at 22 and 18. It was very strange, but." He knew this, his kids, you know, he knew that torso seat had a short torso, so he, that's the adjustment. But I start equal heel height and warlock height. And then you go from there. I mean, if you don't, I mean, what, what, uh, I don't know what Larry was saying, and um, the guys from Cincinnati, I'm losing my mind. Uh, Greg is so true, like, if you look at it, you're looking for something, right? So knocking the pin in a little bit, it doesn't have to be 80, like I've rigged boats for people and they said, oh, six seat is 83.3. Okay. Like, I'm sure that was the result of something and you put a tape measure on it and came up with that number. But like for me, I do whole numbers most of the time. Like, I go from 85 to 84 to 83 to 82. I, like, that pin, I mean, it gives you a lot of angle difference, you know, in the end. Moving your foot stretchers in conjunction with where that pin is gives you a ton more range, right? You saw in that peach system thing that, that uh, Chris was showing, five seat was shifted way to bow, right? So it was an outlier. That guy had the right range of motion. He just needed to shift his foot stretchers six notches forward, right, so that he would get the right angle. I'd never heard of that peach system. Is it's, it within, it's good. It's good. Yeah. Is that should. is that within the um, uh, uh, you know? Can you talk about that for a minute? Oh, I can. Here? I can. Just what is it? It's, uh, so the peach system is an electronic system that you replace your pins. They have this oh, is that wired a new system. thing from no. Nelson. No. no? no. But that does the same, same thing. thing. Oh, okay. So peach, back in the '90s, the Brits came up with this thing, and they would sell it to you, but they close, like, you ever get software that's like everything's like grayed out, you don't have access to it? Mm. Well, they wouldn't give you access to any of the reports. It seems like nowadays you could use a drone and then a protractor. Right. Well, <laughs> so I use a video camera and I pause, I project it on a whiteboard, and I measure angles. That's how I get my angles. So, um, but Peach is great. I mean, it really does give you a lot of information, but it can be information overload. I mean, you can also finagle it, you can manipulate it as a rower. I mean, there's, the good thing with high school kids, I talked to a guy from Green Lake, they have it. He said, no matter who was in the boat that had Peach would always win. <laughs> Put two B girls in it, they would win. Put the one B girls in, they would win. Against each other. It was because they were being recorded. So, for high school kids, I would love to have that on every boat. <laughs> and then we record every workout, so you know we have that kind of you need to work today, so we can see what's going on. But hmm. but the peach system gives enough information. It's angle slippage is that white area you saw, right? That's important. He was saying six, like with the sculling, we're we're trying to get two two degrees is what our target is. So he was saying six. That's pretty sizable. But um, it gives you. Every angle, max force, peak force, it gives you all the grass you can. I mean, it's it's good if you know what you're trying to do with it. So you can you can seize yourself in all the data. So with all the data. So um, if you don't have one of those, uh, like in our rowing venue, we have a bridge, and so they row under the bridge. Mm -hmm. I will record it on coach's eye yep. That's good. and I will figure out everything from that, right. from the videos. Right. It costs me nothing. Right. We don't have any bridges but that are close. Oh. <laughs> but yeah. No, I mean, everybody's got something and there's a way to get around it. Like, you don't, you know, the catch angle, right, with Peach or the new Nielsen, uh, NK Empower thing. We have some of those, right? Um, <clears throat> You can 
when you impeach, you can say, what load do you need to consider suspension, right? Slippage to stop. Like, slippage is your, the time or angle it takes to get to a certain load. So that blade might be in the water, but if it doesn't re reach 150 newtons or whatever you want, then it shows a slippage. So you could essentially show slippage the whole way if you just put your blade in and didn't just let the water push it, right? So, um, you know, do you know that you want to calculate slippage at what, what mass or what force on the, the blade do you need or pin do you need to say that you're no longer slipping? For which athlete, right? For this athlete, I need to be, you know, at this many newtons. At this, for this athlete, I can be less. So, um, I mean, it's good. all those things are good tools, but I still think, you know, truly range of motion, because what I was talking about in reading, setting up a boat, it's about rhythm, right? So, like you can say, you're hitting the numbers. Like I coach a girl right now, she hits the numbers, but at race pace, it's chunky. But she, when we're doing steady state and we're recording data, it's perfect. Slippage is like nothing. The build of back peak handle force is right on. She hits peak handle force within two degrees every stroke. I mean, it's amazing. But at stroke at race cadence, there's just something wrong. But if you looked at the data, you'd be like, oh, perfect. Mm -hmm. Right, so, um, you know, we're messing around with her load and stuff. If you don't know to do that, then, I mean, I talked to a guy this summer who uses Peach, and they're like, this, pers this person has the perfect stroke based on data. But when we coach that person, they do not have the perfect stroke. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's a balance. You can see all the data, but then all that data really doesn't mean anything if you can't see, you know, Pretty much everybody needs to be suspended, get their blade out of the water without dragging it out. So how do I position that person in the boat? If you get too much angle, you can pinch, right? People say there's no pinching, there is. If you get you know, too steep an angle at the finish, then there's, the blade is essentially, there's no effect. Another pinch at the, at the stern as well. So it's just getting that position where your peak force to propel the boat is important. And that rhythm, the time. You know, and that's where we come back to those numbers are for elite athletes at the Olympics. Well, if you like, if you like the way somebody rows, you like the way it looks, the rhythm is right, then by all means, get their numbers and then figure out, calculate your kids' numbers to get that same rhythm, right? Do you understand what I'm saying? Like, so that's... That would be your standard, right? It, I don't even know what that number is, but that number is a standard that you are going to now work for. If you calculate the way I do, say, I don't know, you love how, what's her name, Kim Crow, who she win Olympics, what's her name now? It's not Crow, yeah. whatever. So she, if you like how she rose and her rhythm, remember, rigging is rhythm, not rigging isn't, Anything else? It's either going to be right, or it's going to be slow, or it's going to be too quick, and no, no work being done. Right? You don't mind me asking a couple of questions? Right no, now? not at all. Like, so, so, I'd rather have this interaction. I hear, go through this I hear mention occasionally of coaches timing how long the blades are in the water on the drop. Does anybody right. really do that? Certainly. Yeah? yeah. So, what do you look for? So. so. If you're, that's, again, that's a, that's a preference, right? So, depending on the boat, like for me, if I'm coaching the eight, and I, we're going a certain pace, right? We need to go, you know, 530 pace. Well, then that turns into being in the water for, you know, 4, 0.47 seconds or whatever it is, right? At the proper stroke length. So, am I in there long enough? or enough time, right? Determine that I have the right stroke length, right angle to catch, right angle to finish, because if somebody's screwing around, around row and half slide, then timing is useless, right? So where do I want peak handle force, right? I want peak handle force 0.13 seconds into the stroke, because that's where I get to that angle, right? And that's where, based on my power curve, that's where I, I am. So now I adjust those things. Yeah, the, the timing is important. How 
does everybody know how to achieve their peak handle force? Right? That's a biomechanical review we do with the kids. And we say, get them on a row perfect. Have them row, right? Say, do these strokes. All right, that's your, give me 20 strokes that you think are the most beautiful strokes you've ever taken. Right? You think for it. Now I want you to do 20 strokes where you open your body earlier. See how the curve changes. See how the peak force, where it happens, duration. And now I want you to hold your body closed for a little longer. Shoot your tail essentially. See how it changes. And then we see how to modify that kid, right? If he's an outlier, like usually your bow seat, right? If you watch our bow seat on the, our guy's boat for years, it's been some short little munchkin. I need to keep him in the water the same amount of time. In 2013, it was the first year I didn't rig every kid differently. Right? So you already won. So maybe I shouldn't do it. Right? <laughs> but that was the first year in which we solely bait everything on peak handle force timing, period, everything. And I, I gave these kids ratios, numbers. I said, what's your, what's your torso angle change, right? Delta in your torso angle change versus your thigh angle change between this time and this time. That's your number, right? So how they were picking up the front end. If they were leg oriented, they had a higher number, like a five. Imagine the Italians, right? Slam the legs down with the body open. And then, you know, I don't know, the Germans, one to one, body and legs go at the same time, right? So I would give them a number and I'd say, okay, well, you're coming out of the water too quick, right? Legs, body, too quick, whippy. So you're a, right now you're a 4.2. Well, I need you to be a 2.3. And they go, some of the kids, not all of them, knew, what I, you know, knew how to change, but this kid did. I said 2.3. So he started opening his body earlier. So he was getting that ratio together. Instead of heavily on the legs and driving the hips or shooting the hips and chasing the pin, he was connected to the pin a lot quicker. And that was based on how much time his stroke length was. Right? Mm -hmm. He was getting his stroke length, it was shorter, and he was blasting through the water. So what you were saying, do you time? Yes, it matters. So I changed his approach to how he applies power, right? opening his hips, um, a duration, a longer opening, instead of just you know, keeping what they call the hinge closed and swinging, and that changed his duration in the water, and that also changed his duration to peak handle force, and it aligned with everybody else then. Did that answer your question? Yep. Um, again, it's, it's, all, it's almost like using you know, heart rate monitors. It's like it's information, but right. it, if you don't know what you're looking for, it doesn't really do you much. But good. that's where coming back to like, what those guys were saying, what they watch, right? I mean, what Larry Gluckman was saying, you rig the boat to their fitness, right? If they can't keep the, maintain the hull speed, then you need to change the load. I mean, that's it's pretty simple. So it's not what the number is. Those numbers are good guides to get you started. It's what you see in your crew and then changing, doing what Greg said, take the wrench, smack it in a little, right? Adjust it, make that adjustment because every crew is custom. And if you aren't customizing, then they're not getting everything they should. So if you, you need to make those adjustments, that's it. So who, who's the Eric guy that was saying that he rigs way in? Eric Catalano, he coaches in Saratoga. Oh no, <laughs> not him. <yet. laughs> <laughs> Where? What's that? Where do you coach? Saratoga. Oh, it's Saratoga. So, so the thing that I've, I've tried to experiment, bring in, you know, uh, uh, spreads way in, mm -hmm. way in being like say 157 for a quad. <laughs> and uh, the trouble is, is when you make, a, when you then, have a reasonable overlap, your inboard gets really short, right? Um, who's got oars that you can shorten enough to get that ratio? So it's like to try some of this stuff is next to impossible because you can't get, unless you got the money, right. uh, how do you get short enough oars? That's, That's why I think for Dremels. <laughs> for, for us, you know, we have, we have oars that are adjustable for the girls to a shorter length. For a long time, I, I mean, I pretty much just ordered 370 375 adjustment. Very sweet, right? For sculling, I'll order, you know, what is typical, 284 to 289? Yeah. For the girls, I'll order 279 to 284. Yeah. 
And these are the smoothie too. Yeah. Yeah. And that's that's for I mean our girls are tiny. Like we might have hundreds of kids, but they're all this tall. Did, did you say you go down to below 282? What did you say? Well, it depends. Like if we're but if what's the smallest girls, range that you would uh, pick? It depends. Like we've had some short, you know, 411 girls, mm -hmm. and then I'll pull. There would be 154. You know, pull holy cow. And they they have a little tiny single, and you know, and that's at the end after they've suffered through rowing a 150. Nine or whatever. Ten size thirteen out. shoes. Right. <laughs> so, but that that is the choice, right? And I, I mean, I know that funds are limited. You know, it's the choice. Like, are you willing to do this for your crews? Right. I mean, who has that money? Well, we don't really. But you know what I do? I force every like we assign a vote and say, well, those three girls get that single this season. So, they're all generally the same and they can't row together, they have to row in different ships. That's, and then they get those wars, you know? Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> things are general until, I mean the good thing is, things are general, our priorities are the quads and the eights. So, the singles are like just training tools, essentially. So, I can re-rig quads and stuff and, you know, I order custom stuff, you know, I mean, it costs more, you know, Best Foley hates to do it, <laughs> but, I, we do it, and the, I mean they've gotten more these you know, charges. <laughs> yeah. So you first. Question: Do you place certain athletes in certain seats the standard way of based on their ability and their size? Uh, yeah. Because you were saying you always put the little runt guy in the, <coughs> and the little bow seat. No, uh, that's not always the truth. I'm, uh, typically, I'm saying like you've seen every crew has a short guy in bow. Yeah. Wow. So. The worst, slowest catch is usually stroke seat for me. Everybody always says, what the hell? It's because nobody is now anxious about getting on the foot plate. What happens in high school is everybody comes up to the catch, slams to a stop, holds it there early, and they check the shit out of the boat, right? So, and then, what do they do? There's no load, so they slam on their feet and smack the water like a flash water, right? Well, if stroke seat is going uh, uh, and it has the slowest pickup, then nobody is anxiously hammering on the foot plate, right? Everybody says, what are you doing? And I'm like, hey, imagine this. We took a girl from the middle of the 2V, put her in stroke seat of the 1V, and now the 1V stomps everybody, right? I'm just saying, like, it works. It works all the time. I never, I used to put the best catch in stroke seat, but guess what? We always went slow. Because nobody else can follow. Best catch that ever came from Sarasota was Matt Sabaka. He went to Wisco, two time captain, which is pretty awesome. I feel that kid's a pretty good kid. He rode on the junior national team. He came back and rode for me over the summer, put a quad together with all four junior national team kids that had rode previous, you know, a couple years before. Put them in a stroke seat. We're at club nationals. I mean, we're in the senior quad getting stopped in the heat, like barely qualify. No, in the intermediate quad that, that race was. I'm like, all right, well, right, I'll enter you in the senior quad, but we're gonna change the lineup. We're gonna put this other kid, Alex in stroke seat, you'll be in two seat. And they picked up tons of speed because Alex's catch, nobody can follow his catch. It was too, I mean, it just disappeared. It was like one of those magic tricks. I'm like, oh, and he was on it. But he was on it and nobody else was on it. So we had one guy putting power down for four people, and then three guys picking it up later. So we were slower. So they went out in the senior quad. I said, if you guys get second, we won't practice today. At least second. They got second in the senior quad. And then they meddled in the intermediate quad later, which was more competitive, by the way. Sandbaggers. <laughs> um, but those, like, it matters. Like, I, that, that kind of stuff is counterintuitive. I need the most aggressive person in stroke seat. I need this and this and this. I used to do that. I mean, Used to do it. I mean, one of the boats I, one of my first coaching jobs was, I don't know if you guys know, like Matt Smith and Steve Perry, those guys, coaching college. I was the assistant coach to that boat when they were in high school. And stroke seat was short and aggressive, and that coach that was my head coach was like, I want him, he needs to be able to ramp it up. I, that's, I, that's what I went with for the rest of time, well, for a decade. And then I changed. I was like, well, you know what? If I let them get on it and be a little more subtle and not stomp on the footplate, I say brutalize the footplate, then 
the boat goes way faster, and it does. So there's a set, there's a fine balance. I mean, there, there's always a fine balance, right, between everything. Right? Things are bad. It, you know, moderation is good. Right? A little cocaine is okay. A lot is not. That's a joke. <laughs> um, You're being recorded. Yeah, I know. <laughs> um, but that's the that's trying to find it, and that's that comes with experience. You know, I mean. I had no idea. The first coach that told me what I should do, that was my example. And then I did it, and then I was willing to change. Actually, it was a study I did in college with some professors. Willing to change, and then came up with something new. It was different. And that's exactly what we were talking about rigging. And Eric has been doing, I don't know how long he's been doing that. How long have you been special rigging, like slamming them in like that? Uh, probably 10 years. There you go giving his kids more opportunity to be competitive because he's not just... When I said in that panel about those oars, those rigging charts, about lightening the load for smaller kids, pushing the pin out, right, shortens the arc so it makes your rowing more choppy, you're spiking at the water like this, but the pin out, you in, give yourself more inboard so you do have a greater leverage over the pin, right? <clears throat> But it's because you had this fixed length oar that everybody had to share in the boat. Now you have this ability to have a short oar for this group that you, you're not gluing wood back on, right? That's literally what they did. Cut them off, dowel them, and put them back on, right? Now you have this adjustable stuff. You can do these things and do things that are right for the kids. And that is rigging for the, the rhythm and the ratio that they should be hitting. Yes? Sorry, but... Uh uh, so with with these uh, tighter spreads in sculling, and you know the tendency to get more overlap um, for for smaller people, do you guys think more like in the 14 range, or are you guys in the 16 centimeter? No, always point? keep it the same. I, I keep the standard overlap. No we'll matter what size person, right? Tall people and short people, right. same overlap, right? That's not, that's not what we're trying to change. We're trying to change their arc, their length, arc length, and trying to keep their load the same, right? The gear. Because you don't want somebody to have no, like, the lightest load possible. It takes the, it takes the same amount of work to get down to the course, whether you go slow or fast. So, like, how do you want to apply it? Do you want it to be short and not existent, right? Be washy or do you want to be connected? And connected is this long smooth arc. 110 degrees we'll say. 100, between 100 and 110 degrees. Now this, what we're talking about, inboard is all about comfort. Right? I, I coach against a guy, he's a friend of mine, who puts his boat out at 86, 113 inboard. It's like doing this versus doing this, right? How you... Wait, wait, wait. Use that again and explain the difference between... You guys Excuse are throwing me. numbers around yeah. and yeah. I'm going to fess up here. And no, no, no. Most of this is going over my head. Even so, though I took the level two yeah. coaching, which also sort of went over yeah. my head with Chris. And I'm just so, going to come right out there and confess it. When you, so when you shift the pin out... When you're talking about inboard and whether it's yeah. 82 or 83 and what the length of the oar is yeah. that goes on top of it, can you use that again and explain to me what's going on? So, shifting the pin... Right? If all things are consistent, this is, this is where it's not permanent, I was checking. So you have your pin, it doesn't write either, okay, so. So you have your pin here, right? You have your oar, let me say. That looks generally right. Make this like a little fancy thing out here. If I push the pin out, right, if I keep the oar the same and I just shift, Right? We'll just say that's the point of the tip, right? Of the board. If I now shift it, the pin out, right? This is the fulcrum, right? Of leverage. Like, mm -hmm. good, right? So if I shift the pin out, right? Pull it out this way, I'm now changing that point out to here. Yes. And if I keep the inboard the same, right? I just shifted it over. This is comfortable. This is why. 
spread plus 30 exists because it's comfortable. This is how I can apply my pressure. I mean, biomechanically, you get to apply force that way, right? If I, were, if I shifted the pin out enough that I, I'm exaggerating, right? I'm doing this. Right. That's not biomechanically feasible right. or efficient. Ideally, I want the end of my kid's sweep handle to be right. about on the right. side of the body. You want the center of the handle between your hands to be over the stern, right? That's ideal. That's symmetrical, right? So <clears throat> that's why when you shift the pin out, right, you need to give more inboard. And that's how it becomes lighter because your leverage changes, right? If I now add extra on there, right? If I could add one to one, if that were perfectly in the center, right? It's one to one, right? Whatever I put here, see if I get this force vector, say it's 100, then I get this out here at 100, right? If it's one to one. Yes. Right. So if I, now I shorten this, I say, oh, I cut it off and that's two times, right? This is two times the length then the 100 pounds or 100 newtons or whatever you want to do here now translates to 50, right? So that's the leverage part, right? I'm trying to use pretty even numbers. I hope I'm not rushing too much. No, this is great. But that's, that's input output, right? What, so I'm, I'm glad we, these questions got up because this is like the, the clinic I want to do. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, what happens is most people consider an OR a class 3 lever, which you guys recognize as a teeter-totter, right? Little handle here, little kid comes, sits on it, right? I'm, I'm having fun now. Right? <laughs> All right, so that's what most people think an OR is, a teeter-totter, right? But it isn't, not even close, right? If it were a teeter-totter, then for every meter per second this handle went, in some ratio, if it's 50%, then you would make the tip of the blade go that fast and it would be accelerating water at the same speed. <coughs> Does everyone, everyone understand? So, and you don't, if you are accelerating water, then you are inefficient, right? You're, you don't want to energize water. You want to create the most solid fulcrum you possibly can create out here, right? locked in the water. Right? That's water traveling over the blade essentially like a wing. Right? That's why the fat twos are so tremendous at steep angles, right? because there's no curve to create water turbulence within the system. Right? When you flatten it out and you poke, if I put my hand into the air out the window of a car and I go like this, it goes over pretty easy, right? Fat too, same thing. Little flatter blade, steeper angle. If you start doing this, you start creating turbulence in here, right? And if you're not deep enough, you introduce air, and then you're tearing, and you're making that frothy, terrible puddle, right? Mm -hmm. So that's where you're accelerating water, which is not propelling the boat. Because what propels the boat? Does anybody know what propels the boat? Pressure on the pin. Bam! Right here. This thing. Force here, the largest force vector you can get on the pin, in the direction of the boat's travel, is what makes the boat go fast. Okay? This is the fulcrum, this is input, this is output. Right? The pin is the output. The water, you don't, you don't want output here. If you're getting output here, right, if this is moving, and you shift the output out to here, then you're taking away from pressure on the pin. Right? It's important that you rig so that you can not get too steep of angles, right? If you get real steep, have you seen, I don't know, maybe you've seen the diagrams, I think level two probably has it. Mm -hmm. There's, every time you steepen the angle, more force gets directed into the boat, right? The pinching effect, which is lessened when the boat's at speed and blah, blah, blah. But, so, Keeping that force here at the pin, locked in here, is key. Like, if you overwhelm your blade design, this is another thing, right? If I went one to one, right, one to one ratio, and I used these sweet little bantam oars, I would,
tear through the water with no doubt. Right? There's not enough surface area to be able to handle that load. And that's like the fat twos shorten the blades, so the gearing, the ratio has changed, right? You can be more or closer to one to one because there's less slippage because it's a more effective blade. Okay? So, especially at the steeper angles. That's where, that's where blade design and making sure that you're not overloading what can be supported out here, right? And that's adjusting a person to the, their, their boat, right? If I have a tall person, a really super strong person, right? And this is what Larry asked the question of, of Eric. Would you, chant, would you, by chance, give somebody a different blade design in the same boat, right? I personally, if I had somebody that was just ripping through the water and there's nothing I could do, sure, I'd give them a different blade, right? Because they need to be rigged so they can support their force. If they're just tearing water or, you know, digging down to the bottom <coughs> of the seafloor to stay locked in, well, that's no good either, right? You want to be efficient. You, want, you don't want to have too much looming, right, blade in the, or the oar in the water, it's drag, right? So you want to be efficient in not having anything disrupted. That's where rigging is important. Right? If I rig myself one-to-one -one and I'm tearing through the water, I have a little high school girl tearing through the water, that's not efficient. Right? It's just stirring up water. The bow ball, the pin and the bow ball need to go fast, right? Water needs to go nowhere. It's, we want water to go nowhere. We want to energize zero water. It's impossible, but you want to do it. Um, so, anyway, I digress. Again. So, I can talk about this stuff for 100 hours. Did you have another question, though? Because I skipped over you. No, that was perfect. Okay. Thank you. Um, does it seem to you like uh, the fats are starting to be uh, accepted more, say, on the elite level and then even more so on the uh, junior level? Um, I would say that I've seen very few fat twos at Worlds, but it is not because they're not good. I would say that most of these national teams are historical. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, last year at Worlds, it was the first time I saw the well, Junior Worlds, 2015, not Senior Worlds, saw the juniors with Smoothie 2 Vortex. They changed from Smoothie 2 Plains and Big Blades, right? I mean, the single scholars are going to like what they like. I mean, that's, those are scholars, right? So, um, but I think it's, for me, when I started coaching again, I came to the team and they had Smoothie 2 Vortex. I had always coached with the big blade from the inception of the big blade. So I saw a different rhythm. The front end was a little quicker because it didn't get locked in. It was not as efficient, right? So that vortex thing, I don't, I don't know if you guys know, like that vortex tip, like NASCAR used that same design. When they shaved down their rear fins, right, the spoiler things, they said, oh, you can't, you're getting too much downforce with a six inch tall fin. So they said, okay, you can only have four inch. So all this cars got squirreling, right? And then one of the engineers said, oh, we should put this little triangular design offset triangles down the back side of the car. And it created more downforce than they were getting with that big rear fin. And then those got taken away because those people were cheating. Right? So what that does is keeps the, <coughs> the air tucked to the car and the water tucked to the blade, which is making it more efficient. So it now, instead of just using the face of the blade, the surface area of the face of the blade, the water on the back side, essentially being increasing drag on the back side of the blade, right, for simple terms, now I've, I've almost doubled the surface area of my blade, effective surface area, right? So tearing through the water, like introducing air, not being deep enough, all these things, is inefficient to start moving water, introducing air, energizing more water, right? That vortex tip keeps the water tucked neatly against the back side of the blade. So essentially, you now have a blade that's stuck in the water. It's not stuck, but it's 
got both sides of the face, the face and the back bonded to the water. Right? And that's what you want. It's not bonded, I just like to use that term. Right? It's like wind over a wind, air over a wind, same thing. So, I don't even know where I started with that. But the efficiencies of the blades, oh, the big blades. I think that people will start using them more and more once those people, and these, you gotta remember, these, these people are not haphazardly going about their jobs, they need data. Their jobs are on the lines, their livelihoods. They don't want to just throw the war out there and be like, eh, yeah, what's the new design? Right? I mean, you work with them a lot of time. I mean, it's, it is that. Like, I, I like the Smoothie 2 plane. It might not be the most efficient, but how we apply force, or I teach kids to apply force, it works very well. It, it matches what I like to teach. So, could I coach the other ones? Yeah. Do I really want to? I don't know. I mean, again, I have all the sets of wars that we can afford. <laughs> I don't have this and that, and then they're high school kids, so I couldn't really come up with consistent data. It would be like, I mean, a scattered plot, you know, instead of actual data. So, so um, you're teaching different force application for different blades? You, you need to. Yeah. I mean, now, now, where do you get that data from? Where is, is that around? I'm sorry. Yes, oh, so, no, I mean, so just, is C2 putting out, if, you, if you're using these fatties, you need to be harder to catch. If you're using Vortex, you need to be harder. I don't know if they're saying those words, <laughs> but they definitely give you a definition of this blade is efficient here and you need to apply more force at that point to utilize those words. the blade. I mean, if you want to row a fat two like you're rowing a smoothie two or a big blade, go ahead. It's not going to be as helpful. I, don't, I mean, it's not designed to be, okay. right? It loses, like the fat two, take the extremes, big blade versus fat two. Fat two is very effective at a steeper angle of the catch. And then as you come through, it loses its effect, effectiveness, less curve and all that stuff, hook or whatever. So then the big blade is less effective up here because, like we said, if my blade's like that and the water is coming over the blade, right, it's creating turbulence, right? If you're not matching or catching properly. Well then, over here, the water's change direction. I don't know if most people know that, but the water over the blade changes direction after perpendicular, right? After the blade stalls, mm -hmm. then the water changes direction. So that hook actually helps it. Mm -hmm. Just simple terms. I mean, I could go into it longer, but people would go to sleep. Um, Tries. What? Tries. <laughs> yeah. So, Casey, can I just yeah, add well, something to that? There is one coach in the country that has not absolutely changed his equipment since 1992. And he is the most successful collegiate sweep coach. Has won more team medals than anybody. Okay, and, and he rose, and that's John Murphy. And he rose with men's equipment. Three, uh, um, a 55 blade, 55 centimeter big blade, and almost what the men row, 375, 374. But he teaches a particular type of stroke that that blade seems to work really good at. And it's mostly from the perpendicular right. to the release. And he won't change because he has been so successful with the type of athlete he can attract to Brown. Right. So 25 years mm. of working with that equipment, and he's decided. Same thing with Tom Terhoff. Mm -hmm. Tom, since 2002, has rode with that type of croaker. And, you know, why would he want to change now? I mean, he has the opportunity to have whatever he wants. Right. And he rows the, whatever the S4 or so, whatever what, those things are. Whatever whatever something. So if you find something, right. You know, there are programs, and it may not be Casey's, but there are programs because of the parents' goal to get the kid to where they want to be down the line, could afford the $3,000 to buy a set of boards. It's the coach that says, you know, we're really effective. I don't have any injuries. All the kids can row with this equipment. Just because it's new doesn't mean it's for us. Right. I mean, we've, you've, you've actually worked with a few programs that have switched from their Smoothie 2 planes during the season to the Fat 2 at the end of the season. Right. And or single scholars like one, right. but when you put them in the quad, they right. want something else. Right. So, you know, there is, 
it depends. Like a coach might not know that they are teaching a style that is effective with a different blade. Get some an outsider to come in. Larry comes in and says, "Hey, you need to change to that blade. It'll be more effective." And guess what? I think both of those teams won right after that. They weren't supposed to win. So, you know, it it is like that. If you're not teaching to the equipment that you have, I'm not saying that you that should be the least so common factor. But we we bought a new set of blades at a different time of blades. So yeah. so now I got right. <laughs> now I got real big issues. Well, I mean, it, <laughs> well, it's, it's, Make it with what you will. I mean, I. Just saying. So, yeah. so now for using the one set of blades, they might they might have to do it slightly different than the new blades that we got. Well, definitely. I, this would be my wish, and I think Larry would agree in there, Eric, too. Those things you have to be aware of them, or you're doing a disservice, mm -hmm. right? And you don't want to do a disservice to your kids. Yeah. Like when Chris was asking that we do those biomechanical reviews with the kids to get peak handle force, and we know the time. But yeah, like that's what these parents pay for. Like I, if I, that's why I'm there. I, if, you know, I feel like I wouldn't be doing a job, I'd be collecting a paycheck if I weren't doing all of that stuff. You know, anything that I could to help these kids along. None of our kids, well, not very many of our kids are going, getting recruited for college. The girls are this tall, the boys are this tall. But they're having a blast mm -hmm. in high school, and that's what I want them to do. I want them to be as competitive as they can be, and Eric probably feels the same way. I mean, he has more kids getting recruited, but, like, that's it. I'm trying to do, that's my job as a coach, to give them the best advantage and make sure they're healthy. You know, and that's what this rigging, you know, if you are just crushing it and the load's too heavy because you want to, I mean, there's a college coach that just kills me, fat twos, three, what, what's the, what would the normal orb be? Uh, like a fat two? Like a 370, right, for three. college guys. Uh, 372, 373, yeah. He's a 378 tattoos <laughs> because he thinks that they're not tough enough. I'm like, oh, oh like, whatever. Like, but that's, that's my book of the service, right? Mm -hmm. So, I guess some general basics for setting up the boat we should get back to. Um, you know, the range, the arc, right? The length of the arc for sculling. Can be 110, 100 to 110 is what people are looking for. Sweep 90, pretty much. Um, your catch angles. I mean, it's based on boats, but again, this is where I think it's it's funny that Eric is sitting here. I think we both are talking about like I've seen these numbers for years that were like, oh, your heavyweight should be 160, but this short lightweight guy should be 161, or his oar should be pin should be farther out or whatever it is. It, again, you're not helping the rhythm and this is why I'm, you know, are you looking at them? Are you, are they rowing the rhythm in the ratio that you want to see? Right? And I bet you guys don't want to see short choppy strokes. And so, you know, it is a lot better to row a longer arc with a lighter load because you're going to get more work out of a longer more duration on the same amount of force applied. Right, so it comes back to physics, right? Like if I apply force for a shorter duration, the work is less, right? Does anybody know what the equation is for work? Force times distance. Okay, so if I row 100 newtons and I row it this far, or I row 100 newtons and I go this far, you get more work, right? So making sure that it's efficient work is also key, like putting your blade in and then leaving it in and letting water stack up against the backside of your blade at the extraction, it's, not, it's going to slow you down. You did all that work, you're going to have to do it again to get back up to speed, right? So being effective and making sure those arcs are effective arcs, right? Effective in the sense that water traveling over the blade is efficient instead of, you know, like I said, backing up against the blade, your release is effective. And those angles are comfort-based. Right. If you ever watch a rower, you know, some of our 5'3 girls will get in and they think they're the tallest, they'll push their foot stretchers all the way forward, and they're getting out there past the rigger, and then at the finish, they're like 10 degrees past perpendicular, right? It's not that good. <laughs> so they're wasting their energy out here, right, because you, your body can produce a certain amount of energy. We won't get into energy systems, but like, it's not effective or efficient. You want, when you apply your force, to get the most out of it, right? instead of less. Um, 
So making sure that they're getting that arc length is, is key. And I, someone was asking me on the way over how I come up with that. It's simple, like there's an equation for arc length, right? It's like 2 pi r over the degrees and this and that, right? Does everybody know that one too? Mm -hmm. Maybe. So, like I plug that in, I say, okay, well this is, this is the angle at which I need them to achieve. What's the length? Or, or I'll get on the row perfect and I'll say, this kid's stroke length is 173, which is pretty long. So what do I do? 173 at a normal pin setting for a person will get them at 120 degrees. So push the pins out, lengthen the oars to get them back to the same gearing. And then here's the person rowing the right length, right? Their length, because it is their effective length. Like they're not pancaking out like that to get reached. They're not laying back and doing this. We find their length so that their power is applied and efficient. We take that length and then calculate the rig off of that. So when you heard me say that in that panel, that's what we're doing. If, if somebody at their most maximum flexibility is 145, 140 centimeters, then we change the rig to make that effective and match with everybody in the boat. When you use the word gearing, I get an idea of what it is. Uh -huh. Is it, what more than load is it? It's literally, I am really simple, and again, like I said, this could be totally wrong, but I've been doing it since 97. I take this, right, this measurement, we'll just say it's 10, and then I take this measurement, right, and let's say it's 20, and I divide, right, this into that. So it's outboard over in. And that's my ratio. Is that the coefficient he was talking about? His coefficient, which takes it a step further, well, lots of steps further. But he takes the like surface area of the blade, right? If you take a normal, something like this, right? The blade looks like. Smoothie 2, croaker, whatever. He takes the surface area because the force usually is generated to the center of the face of the blade. But how much water that blade can actually capture, he's taking into consideration the load ratio of that blade, right? How it affects this ratio, right? So it's a modifier. Uh -huh. um, I, like I said, if we were thrown a set of oars that we didn't practice with, I would just scratch. I'd be like, I'm not gonna make you suffer through this. I'm exaggerating, but like those things, I'm, I'm fine with, concept two has some good information. They say, these oars are just like these oars, but you need to shorten them five centimeters, right? That's a good starting point. Well, if I were to regatta, and I rode with smoothie two planes, and somebody said, which happened in Rio, your oars aren't here. Like, your container's not here. Your boats aren't here. Uh, you, you can use these. I'd be like, all right. Well, at this point, I'll get it as close as possible, but it's not going to matter. Because they don't know. They're like saying, don't do something you haven't practiced. <laughs> that would be doing something you haven't practiced. The feel is different. I mean, the kids will feel, like I copy everything in the boat before we leave. I write down every number. From the stern, the pins are this far, the oars, the, you know, the foot stretcher bar is from this, and this angle, and that, this, all the, all the details. And then I get to wherever we're going, and I lay the first rigger out and make sure it's in the right place. And then I measure from that and make sure all, everybody else is the same spacing, the same everything, so they get to be the most comfortable. But then, if you throw some major thing like oars in the, I mean, that's, that's all the feel that they have. And it, I would, I would hate to do it, but they would, I'm sure they'd do it, you know what I mean? But it would not be a good outcome unless they were going to kick everybody's butts anyway. You're doing that for high school crew? Yeah, yeah. I know elite crews that don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Everybody, all the kids on the junior national team this summer laughed at me. All of them. Every day. I'm out there, like, God, this what strokes you, right? Which I didn't want the boat anyway. I wanted them somewhere else in the eight. So I'm like, uh, you know, changing the rig. I got the big angle sticks out there that I made to make sure that the stroke length was right and the, my math was right and all that stuff. And uh, I was making tools because I didn't think I would need to bring all these. So. They're laughing like every day I'm changing things, changing, changing. I'm like, well, I mean, he's not getting to the same catch angle. And his flexibility is terrible, so I need to adjust something. So 
started working around and making sure everything's right. But when we got to Worlds, I said, so how does it feel? We did change one thing. We went from aluminum front stay wing to carbon rear, rear wings. I asked for aluminum, I got carbon, like that rear wings. I, I didn't want to change that even, but I made sure everything was in the same place and at least they got the comfort. They saw me doing it, right, making sure everything was right, so they mentally they were like comforted, comforted by the fact that everything was going to be the same. Foot stretcher angle, height, everything. I mean, Dick D'Antoni and I were pretty meticulous when it comes to it. I mean, I gave, I trusted him with the oars. I was like, Nick, can you please help me? I'm stuck on this boat. I didn't think I was going to have this rear wing and it takes a little longer to rig. And he's over there and I know that he's going to get everything right. And so those kids went out for the first row and went, feels better than the other boat. I was like, perfect. Can't, can't argue with that. You know, I don't want to be like, oh yeah, the heights are lit, it looks okay, blah, blah, blah. Because you're not doing them a favor. You know, I mean, that's, those kids, I mean, if they hadn't meddled, they probably felt like they'd waste their summer. But I don't, I don't like to waste my summer either, so I could be at home, you know, with family, so. Do you um, use uh, any outward pitch? Sometimes. And that, um, one degree, definitely. Um, if the boat is capable of providing that, and then it's really based on what I'm seeing. Like if there's some tearing, everything else is normal, and there's some tearing there, you know, through the finish, you know, one degree is good. You know. And uh, I don't think I've ever done more than, I've done nothing like exaggerated more than that. It would probably be pretty hard to put the blade in the water at a steeper, more lateral pitch. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, it just depends. Again, I start at zero, and you're saying, where do I go? Zero, vertical, totally vertical. You know? And then with the smoothie twos, and especially the fats, um, you know, well, fats especially, uh, not very much even stern pitch, <coughs> like, you know, two or three degrees. Well, I, I think and the fat twos, they recommend, well, early on, when I was re-sleeving them, they recommended five degrees because of how the turn of the blade is, was like negative two or something, right? And so, when we switched from smoothie two planes to those, everybody was digging down to the you know, bottom of the uh, lake or whatever. So, and I had re-sleeved them to four degrees, right, to get that instead of five, right? So I had to put more pitch into the oar lock. Um, so there is a little difference, but then how, what I was saying in that, the panel was, when you start pulling those pins in, right, you gotta think those oars, like, Discussion with Crook. These oars, the new arrow blade was designed for a certain degree into the entry into the water. So a very tall athlete needs more pitch. Are you saying you mean you mean um, um, uh, oar lock uh, off the water? This is all right. Go for it. I, I also have a blade in there. But if you are angle the shaft to the water, yeah, so. Say this blade is designed for this angle, right? Then you start getting tall and tall and tall, right? Obviously the water travels over the blade in a different direction, right? Mm -hmm. So they need more pitch, right? So what's the guy that just won the Olympics? What's his name? Mahe or something? Mahe Drysdale. His oars were, I hope this isn't like not public knowledge, he was at seven degrees, right? seven degrees because if he was so tall, high, he got deep in the water, right? So his angle of attack was much steeper. So when you bring the pins in, you start to achieve that kind of situation because it is steeper to get the blades to depth, you are now steeper in the water. So you have to be cognizant of these things. It's not just, it's not just, you know, change it and everything will be great. You have to change it and then see the result, right? This is, this is, Greg Hall tapping it with a wrench. The result is what he wanted. I don't care what the number is, right? This is where you have to be comfortable with. When I started every job I've ever done, I have notebooks and notebooks of notes. And then after I've done it a while, I no longer waste time on notes, I just remember, right? But there's that, that is a required step. Notes, notes, notes. What happened when I did this, right? I'm a data person, so I like to see results, and I know what happened. Right, how I got there. I don't like to change a lot of things. 
and then say, oh, look, we did it. And then you're like, oh, I don't know which one it was. So, you know, but that's, the key is, at all, everything that I've said, which is all over the place, it is about making sure your boat is doing what you want them to do. In the end, I think it's smart to go record it. Like Greg was saying, I don't know where our boat was rigged at. But when you go get another boat, you better because you don't want to have to start that process again every day, tap, and tap it back out, tap it back in, right? At some point, it was exactly what he wanted. Whether it was 89 or 82. Record it, give it back to the kids, that's what they want. And that's where I was saying, no matter what the coefficient is, right, or the modifier, it's yours. Like, height, I measure from the lowest point in the seat. I work with people that measure from the peak. So we just have to clarify, where did you get that measurement from? That's it, it's just standards, and they're your standards. You don't have to align with anybody else. And you could call this Q, I and mean, it could be W, I don't care. I mean, I, nothing, those things don't matter. It's ultimately, the message is, what, is what are you doing that got your rowers to what you wanted to see? And then that's it. You know, these are all guidelines. Like, I can say, you know, <laughs> you need to be at this angle, in this angle, if you go onto somebody's website for a rigging chart. Catch angle, finish angle. Well, how do you know that my kid's torso is the exact same size as your, this generic information? It's a guide. It is a start. You start there, make modifications. Right? And that's, I know the question that arises all the time, how many people do this full time? Yeah, that's right. So, again, you know, I have the luxury of, well, I go in early and leave late and I do the things that I feel necessary. But if you have another job, maybe you don't have time for that, right? It's, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just try, pick something. Like have, do one thing. I, I would say experiment every, every year with something. Find the results so that you can say, I don't just do this because I do it. This is how I do it. Like that's not a real good answer. The answer should be, I, you know what? I thought this is how I did it. Like a training plan. I, I hired a weight strength and condition coach to come in because I didn't go to school for lift, weight lifting. We, I said, all right, one time in 20 years I'm going to change this one lift that we do. Not going to do it. Still recorded all the information. Got this pro certified guy, went to college for sports science and this and that. More injuries, slower kids. <laughs> what did I do? We had a disagreement, he left, we went back to what we were doing, we went back to fasting. Mm -hmm. No injuries. So, I, I'm willing to experiment, but I, you gotta have, you gotta know what happens with those experiments, or it's just a waste. You're just throwing random stuff out. Time to go. Time to go. Thank you. Oh. Thank you. No problem, I hope it helps. <laughs> <laughs>